So there it is, the story that we know well, the house on the rock, the house on the sand. In some ways, the lessons from this parable are pretty obvious. If you build your life, your house, with good things, on good things, if you build your life, good things, loving things, just things, then it's gonna be a life that shows great strength and ability to do good things, loving things, and just things. And if you have a life that's full of other stuff, whatever that stuff may be, it's gonna be much harder to stand up for good things, loving things, just things. You could say that about your personal life, you could say that about a church like ours. If our life together, our time, and our energy, and our attention is focused on good, loving, just action, then we're gonna show great strength and we're gonna be able to do even more good, loving, and just things. It just grows like a big house on a good foundation. And let's face it, loving, good, just things is what Jesus has called us to do. The story that we heard, this little parable, is only in Matthew and Luke. And they come to us at the, the story comes to us at the very end of what Matthew calls the Sermon on the Mount and what Luke calls the Sermon on the Plain. In a sense, Jesus is making a summation. He's summarizing after a long sermon with many, many teachings in it, his final remarks to the crowd that is gathered to hear him. It's like he's saying, okay, it's one thing to listen to me today. It's another thing to act upon my words. Build your life on my teachings. Now, I don't know if you recall what the teachings are in the Sermon on the Mount, but let me remind you of some of them because he's offering us a great challenge. He speaks in what we call the Beatitudes, and he talks about how the meek, the poor, and the peacemakers will be lifted up. He cautions people that anger, simply anger, can be as harmful as murder. He gives those profound teachings about turning the other cheek, walking the extra mile, giving up your pants if somebody takes your coat. We've talked about these teachings before. All of them are Jesus' nonviolent responses, things that people could do in the face of Roman authority, Roman power, personal creative ways to challenge violent or oppressive or host hostile persons without actually showing anger or violence yourself. So those teachings are in that sermon also. And what else does Jesus teach? Well, he says, treat others as you wish to be treated. Love your enemies. Pray for those who do wrong to you. Give generously to the poor. Don't judge others. Don't worry about your life and the world and seek God's kingdom on earth first above all else. So he gives us all of these teachings and more, and then, then he tells the story about the wise man and the foolish man. Wise are you if you act upon my words. Foolish, foolish are you if you only listen and then walk away, going back to whatever stuff it is that already fills your life. So what's involved, really, in building a strong house? What do you have to do? I think the answer is fairly simple. You simply focus on building that strong foundation and that strong house, and you let others do what they will. You don't tell them what is wrong with their house. You don't run around shouting, look at my house. It has such a good foundation. You just keep building. And as you build that house, goodness and love and justice are the foundation for it. And you find that you, in fact, have built a place, a life, a church that invites people who seek and who need those very things, goodness, love, and justice. And the house just keeps getting bigger. This is so different than fighting for justice, fighting in the name of love, or fighting for goodness. Let me give you an example from India. When I arrived there, there were morning prayers, noonday prayers, and evening prayers, and always at morning prayer there was communion. So on the first morning, 
I attended prayers, as, as was the custom, and at communion, I felt very uncomfortable. Because you see, this ashram, this retreat center in India, is run by the Catholic Church. And even though it's been there for 30 years, more than 30 years, and it's extremely open and inclusive in its teachings and its understanding of the world, I know by Catholic tradition that you are not supposed to take communion in a Catholic church if you are a Protestant or not a Catholic, whatever else you might be. You must be Catholic. And so I wasn't sure, so I didn't take communion. Well, at lunchtime, I talked with my nuns, my favorite nuns, who, by the way, dress in these colors. This is the color at the ashram there. And I asked them about Eucharist, as they call it. I asked them about communion. Was I welcome? I couldn't tell. And they said, oh, yes, yes, yes. You are completely welcome. So I explained to them, I said, look, you know, I know in the Catholic Church, if you're not Catholic, you're not supposed to take communion. So if it's okay here, shouldn't they, like, make a little announcement and, and, and tell us that you are welcome or have something in, in writing or something? And, and Sister Rose answered. She said, Here's the problem. If we make a very public statement or even some kind of printed invitation that you are welcome at communion if you are not Catholic, then we are inviting trouble from Rome should anyone choose to report that. So we do our best to make sure everyone feels welcome and we answer questions like yours when they are asked and that way we can just keep doing what we do. Well, I got this. I got it right away. It wasn't what about what they were saying. It was how they were acting. And I told them, oh, okay, I get this completely. I said, do you know the word subversive? And they looked a little lost. I said, do you know the word naughty? Yes, we do. Yes, yes, yes. We are naughty here in India. Not violent, not angry, not shouting and announcing how wrong it is to exclude people from the communion table. Just naughty. Non-violent resistance. That's what they're doing. Well, the next morning I walked over to the chapel for morning prayers and I went a little bit early. And I walked around outside a little bit. I hadn't really explored very much. The chapel, you can see on the pictures up there, it's very simple. It's sort of an octagonal kind of round building beautiful and on the top of it are these ornate very very Indian art pieces you can see I'm not a great photographer but you can see they're very very intricate and if this was a Hindu temple it would be full of Hindu symbolism but everything up there is a Christian symbol or a Christian figure the the apostles and all kinds of stories acted out and and shown in all of those tiny little figures and I thought to myself, oh, oh, this is, this is really quite beautiful here. This place just sort of suggests that, that there's a blend of where we are in India with whoever comes. And then I noticed these sculptures. Could I have that picture? Around the outside, at every, at every point on that little octagonal building was a sculpture. Now, if you look closely, these are very, very different people. Can you pick out the Western person? You can totally see that his outfit is different than the others. Each and every one of these was different in some way that suggested if you were Muslim or if you were Hindu or Christian or from the East or from the West or whatever your practice was, this was a place of prayer where you were welcome. Well, that was an important thing for me to notice. And then at the doorway, as always, there was a freshly created rangoli. Sometimes they're called columns. And uh, this, is, this is this kind of art, sometimes elaborate like this, sometimes simple like mine outside. This art is everywhere in doorways all around India. Often, most often, it's made with rice flour, colored or left white. And this is so that even the smallest creatures, the ants and the little bugs, can carry it off and eat it as food. So it's not intended to be permanent art in any way. It's intended to be walked on, swept away, carried off by the little bugs. Um, even, even in this regard, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing intended not to last forever. I love that about it. But the early tradition around this is that these works of art were intended to confuse evil spirits so that they wouldn't come inside. And 
if you translate that into more contemporary times, you find that these are many, many places, Christian churches, seminaries, places like the ashram where I stayed, partly because Hindus become Christian and they've brought this very Indian practice with them, partly because it's an Indian practice. Yes, its roots are Hindu, but it's very difficult in a place like India to, to separate the culture from the religious practices. So when you see this in a Christian place, this is what I was told. The meaning of this is that when you come inside, there is only love. Now, that's a translation of keeping evil out. We wouldn't say it that way. But when you come inside, this is a place where you are welcome and there is nothing but love. But when I put all those things together, I really saw that there was no question in my mind that I was welcome at communion, as, as much from what I saw as from the words of the sisters. And so I took communion that morning, and I felt very welcome indeed. In a real sense, in that little ashram in the heart of southern India, they are practicing nonviolent resistance. That's one way it looks. You do the good thing, you do the loving thing, the just thing, you don't fight about it, you don't brag about it, you just do it. This is not about keeping a secret. This is not kind of a don't ask, don't tell thing. This is hearing the gospel and acting on it, and others will do whatever they will do. This is building a strong foundation for a house that will not fall when troubles come. The house in India, this chapel, the house here, these all are places where perhaps we are in fact building on a strong foundation, a house that's not going to fall. This house literally invites us inside. You, me, all of us, no matter if you're a charter member or a first time visitor here, you are welcome. You can come inside, you can be welcomed here, but you can also help build this house because here we try to learn how to do good, loving, and just stuff in the world, how to practice and nurture that so that we live it together, but we also can live it with more strength when we are outside in the world on our own. A house, this house on a firm foundation is one way I think we can talk about the kingdom of God. It feels like a place. It gets described like a place. Maybe sometimes it even looks like a place, but it is really a way to live as individuals, but also together as followers of Jesus. So as we gather at the table this morning for communion, I hope every single person here feels invited and welcomed into this house and to this table. I hope you understand that you're already included. There's nothing you have to do. I hope this understanding comes not so much from me and not from our United Methodist polity that says all are welcome at the table or from printed statements we have that say all persons are welcome here and are welcome at the table. I hope you feel welcome and included because you can sense at least a little our sincere desire our sincere effort to offer some goodness, some love, some justice into the relationships and the world around us. May this be so. Amen.